Good morning. So today we'll be presenting our paper, Compressed Opacity Maps for Ray Tracing. So we aim to cover the following points. Uh, well, the problem we're addressing, uh, what are opacity maps and how do they help, and why would we want to compress them and how? So what is the issue? Well, in 2020, Agruin et al. described the problem, uh, but that was in lockdown, so I'm sure we could all do with a reminder. And the answer is basically alpha tests, uh, particularly if you've got a lot of alpha tests. So um, standard triangles are useful for your typical teapot, bunny, dragon model, but artists want to do things like flora, you know, complicated shapes on leaves, etc. cetera, uh, building components, grills, windows, and maybe damage effects. But uh, modeling these with solid triangles would be costly. So the solution, like rasterization, is to use alpha testing. Now, the standard APIs like DXR and Vulkan RT support alpha testing by the AnyHit shader. Uh, personally, I think ConfirmHit would be a better name. But so when a, tri uh, sorry, when a ray hits a, a triangle that needs to be alpha tested, uh, it basically then launches the AnyHit shader, which makes a decision whether you want to actually keep the hit, in which case you proceed as if it was a, a solid triangle, or you reject it and go back to uh, the traversal. So uh, this is really quite flexible. Uh, you can do it via looking up textures, or you could do some computation, say put a circle on your triangle. But it is an expensive overhead. Uh, interrupting your uh, acceleration structure traversal incurs a penalty, because uh, memory is slow. Uh, you may need to hide many hundreds of clock cycles of latency. And that could be due to, well, just scheduling that any hit shader, uh, having potential texture cache misses, or even just restarting the ASTC. AST. <laughs> anyway, uh, then also there may be many, many layers of alpha testing. For example, in San Miguel or the physically based rendering landscape scene, if we just zoom in on this section, uh, this is just showing the average number of alpha tests just for the primary rays. And you can see regions which have opaque uh, triangles, uh, black, which basically none at all. But you can also get regions where you are doing, well, upwards of six to ten um, tr tests. Um, so it's a significant overhead. So um, how do we solve this? Well, we do some pre-computation, basically, and generate opacity masks. So. In 2020, Gruen et al. presented opacity masks, um, which is basically you take any alpha-tested triangle and can pre-compute an n-squared triangle grid of sub-triangles. And each sub-triangle is marked with one of three states, T for completely transparent, O for completely opaque, or C for check using an n-hit shader. Now, the T and O states completely avoid running the n-hit shader. Uh, the mask can be stored with the triangle acceleration structure, and then the ray triangle tester is modified to read that mask. So in this particular example, you get about a 53% saving in alpha test um, launches. Uh, sorry, any hit shader launches. So the question is, can we do better? So Gruen et al., uh, they looked at four alpha text, uh, textures and showed that higher resolutions get you greater savings. Uh, we confirmed that with a set of 170 textures, and um, <coughs> you can basically s uh, see that the gains diminish. So we've got cases where we've got uh, a 32 by 32, and if you jump to a 64 by 64, you get about a 6% a saving. But if you quadruple the storage again, it, it, the saving only increases by 3 or 4%. But it certainly helps in alpha-tested scenes. Uh, going back to the landscape scene, putting on a, an op opacity map, well, simulation here, you can see that the number of tests has plummeted to typically less than one per ray. So can we do better? So why do individual triangles? And can we do better than two bits per region? So uh, we started looking at individual triangles, but flora models commonly use meshes of at least two triangles, and sometimes quite weirdly. Um, so can we ex exploit the coherence um, some hardware systems, another observation, sorry, not some hardware systems, Intel's imaginations, store or test pairs of adjacent triangles with a shared edge. Now, there's several reasons for wanting to do that. Uh, there's some details down on the poster uh, in the foyer. 
but basically the AABB of a pair of triangles is rarely much bigger than either of the two constituents. Uh, testing a ray against a pair of triangles can share the maths of the shared edge, and you get a 33% reduction in vertex storage. I mean, you can do more if you do uh, strips, but the it, trying to find those uh, drops off very rapidly. So another observation. Um, so Gruen et al, they stored it as two bits per uh, state. Uh, they, they did note it could be uh, compressed into, into less data. Now, we read that as meaning uh, log three uh, bits per tri sub-triangle. So you want random access, so maybe you would store five sub-triangles for every byte, which allows completely random content. Um, but textures are rarely noise, so a smaller footprint seemed um, feasible. You want a higher resolution, um, but with, so that gives you larger savings, but that comes at a storage cost. So compression is desirable, but you need fast random access, so that rules out a number of compression uh, schemes. Uh, we also felt that you want to store the opacity map together with the vertex X, Y, Z data for efficiency. You don't want the additional latency of going out and fetching that data after you've made your um, decision that you possibly hit the triangle. And it probably should be about the same size as the vertex data because you don't want the additional uh, storage and um, bandwidth. So our approach was to, well, we considered taking pairs of triangles but rather than storing them as two individual maps, storing them as a s combined square map um, using square subregions. And also was to bring back vector quantization uh, that was used in computer graphics um, some time ago. So just looking at some examples of uh, some square opacity maps uh, being mapped to two triangles, uh, we expect there to be similar behavior across the shared edge. And we also think they should be frequency limited. There'd be no instant transitions from uh, completely transparent to completely opaque. We um, refer to this in the paper as the continuity assumption. Now, we want to compress and de uh, decompress them, but the decompression, like texture compression, needs to be fast and provide random access. Uh, we want to avoid any additional sort of clock cycles in decoding. And we also would like the decompression to be cheap, small, and, uh, because it's likely been hardware and PPA uh, rules, especially in the uh, system on chip um, area. But the compression can be lossy. Um, provided it's conservative, you can safely replace an opaque with a check, but you can't do, go the other way around. But you don't want too many lossy substitutions because that simply undoes the benefits of uh, the opacity map in the first place. So uh, going back to VQ, so it was used in texture compression in the late 1990s. Um, Beers et al. sort of introduced it in, eight, in 96. Uh, Sega Dreamcast used it uh, for two bit per pixel and one bit per pixel texture compression. And it's even, even go back earlier if you count palletized textures. It is a lossy compression scheme. Um, basically, the pigeonhole principle says it must be. But it is a very, very simple decoding algorithm. For example, if we have two by two vectors, you store a uh, half-resolution um, index map containing uh, locations inside a vector codebook, and that returns a, say, for example, two by two uh, vector of colors. So why did VQ disappear? Well, it kind of fell out of fashion. Um, the cost of hiding that second uh, vector code, uh, codebook lookup um, was just too costly. For example, Dreamcast had a second texture cache entirely dedicated for the codebook. Uh, also, the, the compressor is a global process, but that's not so much of an issue here. So other, other schemes like S3TC, PVRTC took over because there was no second dependent memory lookup. But if the index map and the codebook are, are loaded together, the, the latency is eliminated uh, entirely, so that's a win. So we started an initial investigation using two by two uh, vectors. Um, our target was one bit per region using a fixed storage of 256 bits, uh, which is typically about half a cache line or uh, on a GPU or, or slightly less than the X, Y, Z data for a, a pair of triangles, which then forces a 16 by 16 resolution. So we made some more observations of the test data. So uniform two by two vectors are really common. They typically occur with about a 11 to 30% um, frequency. 
And we also often found symmetry across the test data. So this is a leaf from San Miguel, and you can see that uh, the vectors circled in red reappear in the quadrants, but each time rotated by an extra 90 degrees. And other data, we found that there was reflections around X and Y or around diagonals. <coughs> so we can use this to reduce the size of the stored code book. Which brings us on to how do we represent each vector in the code book. Now, it may appear that there are 81 different possibilities for a 2x2. Two two, so do we really need 7 bits to represent it? But by the continuity assumption, you can't have both O and T states in the same 2x2 two two vector. So it turns out there are only 31 possibilities, so we can use a virtually ideal uh, 5 bits, which leads to an utterly trivial encoding where you have 1 bit to de determine which pair of choices you've got, and then 4 1-bit indices. So we also need to store the transformations uh, for three of the quadrants. So uh, the ch these are chosen from a palette of eight. Um, and each of these choices can be generated by combining three optional simple transformations. Um, these can be either applied to the actual stored data or to the coordinate LSBs inside the vector. And for, for example, you can choose to optionally rotate by 90. Uh, if you chose by 90, rotate by uh, top and, oh, sorry, flip by top and bottom and then flip by lef left and right, you would generate a rotation by 270 degrees. So we've now got to fit our stuff into our 256-bit budget. So we know there's 64 vectors in the map. So how many choices should we allow? Well, uh, basically, 4 was too small. 16 basically used up all the space that so was useless. So basically, Goldilocks value was 8 choices, i.e. 3 bits per vector. Now, we've all, we're storing 3 transformations, so that's another 9 bits, which left us 55 bits for the code book, so we can store exactly 11 vectors. Now, the uniform vectors were really common, so we don't bother storing those in a code book. We just use some dedicated indices. Um, and then we decided to assign three vectors to be global. They can be accessed by any of the quadrants. And the remaining eight were split amongst the four um, quadrants. <coughs> so uh, we wrote a very, very simple compressor. It's not my proudest bit of code. And it simply tried all two to the nine possibilities of uh, transformation. And then for a given transformation, it, while the code book wasn't full, it just greedily chose one of the vectors from the set, basically the one with the fewest total uh, check texture cases. And then once we'd filled the code book, any leftovers were assigned to the best compatible vector in the code book. Uh, this worked much better than expected. Uh, very few conservative um, replacements were made in practice. So the, the blue top line uh, basically represents the uncompressed test data, which we've basically saw, well, 100 se sorry, 180 or, sorry, 100, 170, my apologies, 170 test uh, things which we've sorted from easy to, uh, easy to store or the ones, ones, ones with the, the fewest number is opaque and transparent on the left through to the ones with the most. And you can see the purple line, which is the compressed, there's very little sort of drop in, in savings. But you can compare that with a lossless store uh, of the, with the same amount of bits, which is basically two 64 sub-try um, opacity masks. And you can see that there's basically an 8 to 16% gain in savings. So since that worked so well, we thought we'd try something more ambitious. Uh, so basically aim for high resolution, but without increasing the storage too significantly. So in this one, we decided to try for half a bit per region using a fixed storage of 512 bits, which is about a cache line. So that's a 32 by 32. Now uniform, opaque, and transparent vectors are just as common. After all, it's just basically a high resolution version of the previous one but we do expect fewer check texture states. So our storage budget then we decided to assign four bits per um, index. We still have the tr um, transformations per uh, quadrant, leaving us 247 bits for the code book. And so we have to decide how we're going to store that code book. Uh, so unlike a 2x2, two two, you can have all three cases in a 4x4 four four vector, but thankfully not the 43 million possibilities um, if you just took the naive approach. And by continuity assumption, there's actually only around about 200K, but 
storing those optimally with 18 bits would, well, be very unpleasant. So instead, we just simply subdivide it into two by twos and go back to the VQ2 encoding scene, which is 20 bits. It's simpler, slightly wasteful, but we don't care. Uh, however, we did notice that quite a lot of the, of the cases actually only had two, two choices, so we can use an encoding similar to VQ2. And we also thought if we partition horizontally and vertically, we can get somewhere that's sort of in between the fully generic and, and the, the simpler case. And then we can combine those basically to meet the 247-bit budget. So we needed a better compressor. So we basically went back to Heckbert's median cut and get inspiration. And it's, this one is still a greedy algorithm. It basically uses a top-down partitioning scheme. So you have a set of, set of vectors. Well, you have sets of sets of vectors. You take, take one of those sets and split it into two. And basically repeatedly subdivide until of those into smaller and smaller sets until you have the same number of code book entries. So there's more details in the paper. But in this particular case, we have one set there uh, and basically has a representative. And the error of that is 27. We split those into two smaller sets and the combined score of that error is only 12. So how does this work with its, uh, it's basically it's a lossier compressor, but how does it work? So um, it's still around 10% better than the equivalent uncompressed format, which would be a 16 by 16 at two bits per region. And further, the additional hardware required to decompress a 32 by 32 over a raw 16 by 16 is going to be utterly tiny tiny, and certainly negligible compared to the rest of a ray triangle tester. So we do have some future work. Um, although the VQ4 compressor is more sophisticated than the, the predecessor, it's still a greedy algorithm. Uh, a more intelligent search, pay, maybe with backtracking, probably should do better. Uh, we're also assuming the existence of the uh, uniform 4x4 uh, check texture vector which is probably suboptimal in a lot of the cases. So we'd like to investigate ways of synthesizing some other vectors for, from what we've stored in the code book. I haven't actually mentioned this previously, but the Vulkan has an opacity micromap uh, extension, very similar to Gruen et al's. But they, have, uh, a, they, they can have an option to store four different choices, but then they map that down to just two uh, for cases where you're doing, say, stochastic sampling, where a jaggy edge would be totally um, uh, not noticeable because you're basically scattering your samples. So we need to investigate whether we can do a hash on a three values to just two, probably basing it on how many um, of each state are in, a, in, a in each block. And finally, can we adapt the acceleration structure traversal so that if you're, say, doing shadow maps where you don't care which is the closest, just whether you've got an opaque blocker, if you were to get a check texture taste, could you just like defer it because there's a good chance you'll find an opaque or a, either a opaque triangle or an opaque thing um, a little bit later on? So in conclusion, uh, we already knew that opacity masks could lead to savings in ray tracing with alpha-tested primitives, and the higher resolutions gave a greater saving up to a point. So we're investigating using fixed rate uh, compression for opacity maps, uh, which allows us to have a higher resolution for the same sort of like storage budget. And we propose using square maps for pairs of triangles for VQ compression. And I feel what we've demonstrated that despite the compression being lossy, it is beneficial. Um, thank you for listening and any questions at this time? Thank you for the great talk yeah. as well. Um, we actually do have some time for uh, questions, so please, please ask away. Nice talk. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, e you basically reduced the memory footprint. Have you kind of done some measurements on how performance actually is affected because of the reduced memory footprint? Because you have less cache pressure, yada, yada? No. Um, so this will be for future hardware that will be coming along. So um, no, we haven't actually done that. but. We kind of know what the bandwidth is for various operations being done. And we know what would happen if you were to do, you know, we know how many cycles. Okay. For example, in SOC land, we probably have to absorb 
400 to 500 clock cycles of latency mm. if you want to do something. So you need to store that stuff nearby and we don't, we've got a small budget for our caches. We don't want to be filling, ex uh, loading too much stuff at the time. So we can, si we can see that it will be a, a big saving. Um, just don't have any sort of exact empirical okay. values at the moment. Um, however, uh, <laughs> I think NVIDIA had some description of the, the micro maps and that was getting them a 50% saving uh, over sort of not, not doing it. So basically we can imagine the same sort of thing, but we need, we need the compression for, for um, mobile um, size chips. Okay. And one thing I didn't really get, y you need to sort them close together because your cache line size is bigger than your vertex data because if you fetch something, you overfetch and if you kind of put the opacity mid right next to each other, you kind of get everything at once. Yes, that, that, that's the idea. You want to just do one burst of all your exactly. data in. You don't want to do, do two, two bursts and, for, for, and random disparate locations in memory. That, that's costly. Okay, thank you. In, in your VQ4 representation, it took 512 bits, and, and that's a whole cache line, you said, right? Uh, or, it depends what part of the chip you're in, but yes, or, uh, it's the order. Or, yeah. Uh, okay. So. so I, I'm not seeing where you save the, the uh, latency. If, if your whole cache line is full of the, the opacity data, then your vertex data is in a different cache but, line. But you want, you'll get a burst. So basically, you'll go out to memory and say, please read okay. two so, lines of data in one go. Okay. So, so you're consuming multiple cache lines through one fetch. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Any more questions? People want to get thrown at? <laughs> Just throw it behind you and see where it lands. <laughs> all right. If that's not the case, then thank you again. Okay. Thank all the speakers thank again. You.